it's much more what happened collectively. Sure, sure. It was sure. The, the kind of moment, the beginnings of the women's movement there, how people uh, started to, well, do the famous consciousness raising, yeah. recognize what the problem was, mm -hmm. you know, start the inquiry, do the um, interrogation, as it were. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, we had to do everything at that moment. It was like invent the theory, change our personal lives, get the law changed. You know, yeah, so yeah. it was just like, oh, it's out there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it, it filtered through into the practice. You know, what I'm trying to explain mm -hmm. is how it, it kind of lost its center totally. Mm -hmm. And everything was happening outside. Yeah. And that was the orientation of everyone was outside. So, so it's like <laughs> counter, the counterculture yeah. became yeah. that the Yeah. And the institution and your or I feel like my education was from other places. One of the more interesting things I found out in doing it is that it seemed to have more impact politically even than other projects that I could think of more conventionally in those terms. So that, I don't know, does that make any sense about this kind of integration of, of how the social movements, the changing intellectual culture, the personal <laughs> experience, and the work and the pedagogy all come together, you know, at this moment. Yeah. Not in any easy way, but just some kind of dynamic mess, you could call it. You know, in the very early 70s, and when I left St. Martin's in 1970, I went to work with Ray at, as well at the London College of Furniture and Interior Design, which is in the East End of, of London. And we kind of tried to, I mean, I tried to introduce these things into the classroom situation there. It was like, um, what documentation I do have. <laughs> so it, it was kind of setting up the, it was very much based on Sassur and Bard, right? And kind of setting out this um, conceptual framework and then getting students to think of what they were doing. They had no idea. They were just, thought we were insane. You know the European system, but just teaching by exposure to personality. Ah, okay. Then we actually began work on costumes ourselves. More, most students talk freely about fantasy, eccentricity, and the social limitations of dress. And we extended these observations to a formal analysis of each piece, demonstrating how form, size, texture, etc. condition meaning. And we were also able to understand the semiological analogy of how language determines speech which is like the beginning of my now famous critique method. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did a Cal Arts in the 80s. Which, um, and I started, I did it at Nova Scotia, College of Art and Design. And because these were two places where it was possible. I mean, I, and uh, it was, and still is, I still, I still do this. Uh, a very, very detailed reading of the work where the artist doesn't speak at all. But everyone else kind of works on the, the reading of the piece, semiotically speaking. So here, I mean, this is another thing. I don't know if you want me to go there, but that's a lot to throw in. Yeah. That it's kind of projecting into the future. How, uh, in my own work, you know, going into psychoanalysis takes you into a kind of post-structuralist moment and into the importance on the side of the reader of the subjective investment in the work. So now many years, 40 years later, <coughs> I kind of divide these things up, I do in, in my courses. So when you have a crit class, I take a kind of um, structuralist in the sense of semiotic approach that emphasizes the signifying material reality of the piece, which means that given the common kind of cultural interface that we can say that 
it's something like the signifier, which is the brush stroke. You know, whether it, whether it's impasto, right, or a lot of medium that you, we kind of read this in combination with another sign, which may be, uh, or another signifier, which may be simply the, the shape or the way in which it's confined within a field. And then this is taken in combination with the privilege certain sign systems, whether they're iconic, whether they're um, index card, whether Well, symbolic is a bit tricky because I mean that in a Sicilian sense, like to do with words. Not symbolism, but to do with abstraction. Um, <clears throat> so once you get to that point, you're able to kind of look at the bigger system involved <laughs> in the work. And that uh, is how it's organized at the level of perspective. But this, I believe, is as fundamental to human experience as when you're learning to speak and establishing kind of differences between consonants and vowels. When I went to Cal Arts at first, there, there was Michael Asher's yeah. kind of, yeah. and, the, and students on their own, they named this the, uh, that was the phallocentric method, and mine was the cone-centric method. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because, you know, that in his, the artist is on the spot defending what they did. And in mine, the artist is removed, and everybody else is doing the reading. So the Whitney is another you know, place that it only exists because of 68, like Nova Scotia and the Calabans. And it is very much uh, a program that doesn't give a degree, so it doesn't have to represent everything, but it tries to bring people, artists and, and critics together uh, in a way that kind of supports their projects and their interests in social issues and also to create a certain kind of intellectual community. That's what's very special about that situation. When I came to UCLA, what I wanted to do when I started the interdisciplinary area was to um, carry on things that were done at the ISP in terms of getting a place for site-specific, institutional critique, project-based work, and to create a, a way that this intellectual community could continue like, and get a degree. <laughs> but I can see from 10 years of having the interdisciplinary students, you know, how I was able in this context to, to really work out a system of teaching which uh, <clears throat> I was saying that there were the three components, and I never finished that. Uh, that there's the crit, which focuses on the, you know, the semiotic approach to the individual work. But of course I had to acknowledge, as I did in reviewing modernist criticism, that you never get this utopian situation where you're looking at one work. It's always in uh, the context of the exhibition. That's the real equivalent to the film, is the exhibition. That has an author that's not always the artist. <laughs> it's a, it has a curatorial authorship. And it kind of, uh, at least in my view, it requires a, a different form of analysis, um, which is not necessarily kind of based so much in linguistics, but more what I would do is I go to Foucault to a kind of non-subjective theory of the subject and things that will give you the opportunity to ask, you know, who's speaking and for what reason, what's the discursive field, you know, how does the exhibition um, function in, in that context. And so then I, I would take a specific exhibition. I haven't done this for a while because there haven't been any really good exhibitions <laughs> for doing that, I felt. Uh, but, um, you know, I would look at the individual works and maybe use a semiotic approach to the analysis of individual works, but it's more about looking at uh, the way Foucault would say what are the points of convergence and and, uh, and kind of dissonance, because in the exhibition what's most productive of meaning over the whole is actually where work does not fit 
you know, it, and it, the curator can never consolidate that. That I and mean, that's good. That actually is productive. So it, it helps you to kind of understand how its specific image discourse is making an, an argument and what kind of slips through. You know, what's in excess of that. Of course, that doesn't deal with the question that we referred to as the subjective investment of the, of the reader. And the reason that um, I don't focus on that in the context of the work is because I feel that's just too much of what gets done all the time. People bringing their own issues and looking at their own navel, as it were, instead of the work. And um, it can be done interestingly, like Andrea Fraser does to make, kind of make people aware of what they're bringing. But I felt that uh, it was important to, in the psychoanalysis in the field of vision course, to kind of look at what the very specific object of the discourse is, which is sexuality and the unconscious, and why it's not, I think, too useful trying to apply it directly to the art object. I hate that, <laughs> in, in a way, because it, in fact, what it gives you more understanding of is that question of like what you're bringing to your own practice and to the reading of, of, of others' work. And every, the kinds of things that it um, is able to address <coughs> are so fundamental that they apply to everything, but in, in the most kind of general way. But an artist has made this very, very specific use of it. And one of the, uh, well, two things, you know, that I would say now that perhaps I wouldn't at that point is that I now think that it's a very ethically necessary way to look at art. Maybe not the only way, but I say it's ethical because it actually acknowledges that the work is separate from you, that it's different, that you have to kind of leave your baggage behind and be open to the possibility of what you might find out there. It's not like your work. You're not making your work. You're absolutely passive or medial in a sense, and, and you have to be in that frame, which my students make fun of by calling it the Zen moment, you know, where I make everybody close their eyes and not think about anything and then as um, Carrie would say I start with the phenomenological you know what is it when your eyes are what was the first thing that you know are you thinking it, it's the way it resonates in your body just somatically you know oh, it was light or it was empty it was so uh, it was confusing or it was you know what's how much meaning is already in place there and how do you kind of pull yourself away from of, of what you're bringing and what the artist is bringing to that situation through the work, but not through their biography. You have to just unrealistically pretend you don't know them in my <laughs> class, which I know is absurd, but you know, just trying to pull away from that, not to make any assumptions on that basis. And often, you know, like we as artists are not fully knowledgeable about exactly what it is we've done. There is an intentionality. You appreciate it if, if people can try to follow that, that argument. But you can find out things yourself. <laughs> it, it, so why put you on the spot to say over again in words? You know, what, what you did in, in, in another way. I mean, I think that's useful educationally, you have to learn how to do that. But I just felt always there wasn't enough of the other, a, a respect for all the work that you had put into something. You know, there must be more to it than just someone asking you, why didn't you do this? Well, maybe you don't even know, but I did that. So what does, what does that mean, right? Yeah. The context. So a lot of this is about anticipation and decipherment, not about judgment.
And then the separation that I would now make between the position of the viewer and, and the position that you're in as an artist making the work. The work. Of course, you're absolutely, you know, passionately engaged in a position. You can't kind of neutralize that, and it's necessary for the work. I think, you know, it's no accident that I was invited to places like Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. Cal Arts, mm -hmm. and then and the Whitney program that I worked with, because uh, that's a direct line from what we were talking about. You know, conceptual work, visual research, interconnectedness of pedagogy and, and practice in you know, those situations. And I think that, uh, you know, UCLA is a different situation. It didn't come out of those moments, and I could frankly say I never thought of myself in that context, <laughs> or, or that I would be there. As far as, I didn't know he wanted to jump up in time from 73 to when yeah. I was at UCLA, but this is, my idea of the course is that the, this is not just a group of visiting artists lectures or something like that, but it's actually, it's thematic, and it's one where I've never taught a course on feminism or isolated the issue in that way. It's always integrated. Mm -hmm. And things like you know, object choice or issues to do with race and queerness and are integrated into the issue. And then you have the seminar, artists take the course, and they prepare questions which they address to the speakers in the public forum. And so you could see that as a direct I suppose kind of outcome of this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or kind of um, more expansive extra institutional attitude towards teaching from the beginning. What you've reminded me of in the interview is how we broke away from the institutions. Like St. Martin's isn't where the interesting thing happened, it happened outside. And then everything we were doing, no one would touch it, you know, like Cambridge or the University of, you know, it was all out there. And so, and all the first teaching I did, you know, when they all thought, this was like crazy, totally crazy. And when I did post postgraduate document, like, there was no conceptual work that touched on like that. And people used to get into arguments and fight each other over it, and it was, it's not as though it could be integrated in any way at that moment because um, it was all very experimental. My own opinion is I think it's not so useful trying to figure out what is California or what is LA because now that's not necessary. And you, you don't say, you don't organize an exhibition of like New York artists. Or, or it's a kind of, it's meaningless. If you're there, you're assumed to be in the center. <laughs> and I, I think it should be more like considered in that way here, rather than making it sound like it's a periphery by labeling it even. Because if you go to shows now in New York, most, lots of them are by. LA artists everywhere. I mean, it's not um, the same world. It's the post, um, you know, helter skelter world. <laughs> but I, I personally really, really think that having uh, art education, if you want to call it that, in um, the university context is is important. And I think. As much as I love the standalone art schools that I've been associated with, because they're the radical products of '68, um, <clears throat> I think that this the kind of transdisciplinary project, as it were, gets served very, very well by integrating it into the university. It's like what you can make make use of there, and it's also about how you how you think about a research university and think about art in that context. And the other view, you know, which some artists that I teach with would express is 
more the professional school model. And of course, when you don't have the progressive ideologies, say like CalArts or Nova Scotia, you just have a standalone school. Well, it's a professional ideology that, that dominates. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the, you know, the research orientation, which allows you, you know, to be project based and to kind of undertake something, which doesn't have as its kind of immediate validation um, that professional outcome is still extremely important. Very, very important because the, the professional world is, is extremely volatile and very subject to market um, you know, fluctuations. <laughs> at the level of the entertainment industry. So you need something that allows you to be grounded in a way that can ride out all of that confusion. And, and just because I believe in education for no reason at all. But you don't even have to do anything with it. It's just about having a fuller, more meaningful, interesting, Life and it's a right. Everyone should have it.